All right, well, welcome, guys. You're at the right place to learn about the many mistakes made in pricing communications. And at the end of this video, we're going to explain how pricing communication should actually work. So I'm Bo Gaines, the Throughput Accounting Guru, and I have with me Brad Stallone, the inventor of the Velocity Pricing System. So welcome to the Science of Business channel, where we use the theory of constraints and throughput accounting to increase your bottom line. This is the home of the Velocity Pricing System, which you can find at velocitypricingsystem.com. So let's dig into profit killing job shop pricing mistake number three. So mistake number three is a failure to communicate well or at all sometimes. So Brad, we've seen a, gosh, just a myriad of issues related to pricing communications and working with people on pricing. And we've tried to categorize most of what we've seen, not everything, but just kind of to give you guys a good sense of things into three buckets. And the three buckets are mindset problems, you know, kind of mentally how you're thinking about it and engaging in pricing communications, basic communication skills. And we do mean just basic communication skills. We've seen a lot in that, that category as well. And then kind of procedural problems about how the process of communication happens with your customers about pricing and other things. So to dig in, people treat things just like another quote. You know, uh, it's, you know, it's Monday morning. It's I'm just rocking and rolling. I take the number. I put the PDF on the email. I say, here's your quote, Mr. Customer. Thanks for your business. Blah, blah, blah. Boom. Send. What I don't do is actually engage in the process and say, hey, what's actually happening? Are we raising prices? Do we need to explain things? Should I call somebody? You know, now, all those are communication things, but it's linked back to your mindset. If you're clocked out and you don't care, you're going to totally screw up with pricing communications. You know, another one, Brad, that we see a lot is people bringing personal beliefs or feelings to the table with regard to pricing. You know, it'll show up in the form of, well, that's not fair. We can't do that. And, you know, our position is that pricing and fairness, two, two polar different worlds. It's just not even connected to one another. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't have appropriate pricing. But um, people bring their uh, perception of fairness to the table and what's fair to them may not be fair to you as the business owner, nor fair to anybody else in the organization. But um, that's you know, their personal beliefs at work there. And that would be compounded by a bad measure. So if, if, you're, if your target measure uh, has an element of fairness in it, you know, percent gross margin, then yep. you, could, you could fall into that trap really quickly. Yeah, and Brad, there tends to be like an artificial ceiling. You know, once you go above 40% gross margin, it's, oh, we're in, eh, you know, it's, it feels like we're getting greedy, you know. But, um, yeah, but that you're right. That That's just complicated and amplified by the bad measure of gross margin. Um, the third one there, missing the boat entirely and leaving money on the table. So many times, it, you know, a, a lot of times when if you're not paying attention, if you don't care about what you're doing, you're just going to miss golden opportunities you know um and you got to be attuned to this you got to be looking for the opportunities but it goes back to that mindset are you looking for ways to you know take advantage of your pricing to have a great pricing strategy and to accommodate what your customer wants and needs at the right price or are you just going through the motions so the final one is just going with what's there never asking what should be there and so a lot of times our customers are very um our clients are very, uh, very technical, very savvy uh, on the technical side of things. And, and they have, I, I think many of our clients, Brad, are considered absolute experts in their field, but they're dealing with customers who are not. And they'll get these requirements on a RFQ or, you know, on, on something the customer's requesting. And they look at it and they're like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Oh, well, the customer asked for it. We got to quote it. And, and it's like, no, don't just quote it because they asked for it you're the actual expert what should they be doing and this is probably an opportunity to reach out to the customer have a conversation and actually communicate and coach them through what they need and develop a better solution than what they're asking for but so many times especially in the engineering world people just say this is what's on the this is what's on the rfq we got to go with it we can't quote anything else this is what they want but that's not true and, and i think that's where communications comes in pick up the phone have a conversation and uh, flesh it out with your customer. So looking at basic communication skills, well, we've got a couple here. Uh, poorly communicated and enforced terms and conditions. So instead of saying, 
um, you know, our payment terms are, uh, you know, 210 net 30. We go, well, we, we kind of, you know, Brad, I'd like to maybe be paid on the, you know, uh, you know, whatever you can, we, you know, like, I trust you, like just day 30 would be nice, but what, whatever you feel like doing, man, um, that's not a term and condition that that's a plea. All right. Terms and conditions are, Hey, uh, our invoices are due uh, 210 net 30. And at the end of net 30, if we don't have payment, we're going to have to, I guess, escalate through our uh, finance department. And it could result in you being put in on hold. So that's our terms and conditions related to payment. You got to have some discipline and communicate these things. Another is poor choice of tone or words. <laughs> and I feel like in this you know, post pandemic era, Brad, we've, you know, tensions are high uh, and you see all these comical videos like online or whatever, where just terrible customer service. You know, I'm thinking of like some fast food place where the workers are fighting the customers and it's like, you know, we see that though. We see very poor choice of tone and words, people just not thinking about what and how they're saying it. And then in procedural problems, what we have, well, a lack of follow up, person dependent communications. You know, you ever called someone and say, hey, uh, I want to check on the status of my order. Oh, well, Bobby's not in today. Okay, well, I didn't realize, you know, I contracted with Bobby, but okay, well, when's he getting back? Well, I don't know. I don't do the vacation schedule. Oh boy. You know, it, it, when you get that kind of call, it's like, Oh, here we go. You know what you're in for. That's person dependent communications. We definitely don't want that. And then reactive communications versus proactive communications. <laughs> you know, I, I'm imagining the same company again, calling them up. Hey, where's my stuff at? Oh yeah. We, you know, we meant to call you, uh, actually the truck broke down on the way there and it's going to be another week to get it to you. It's like, Oh, why didn't you call me when you found out? Right? So that's proactive versus reactive. And you see a lot of that. And then also loose ends and loss of communicating along the way. So, uh, you know, going back to our client base, Brad, we have a lot of folks in technical industries and there's a lot of details that need to be kind of fleshed out. What size, what spec, what material, what, you know, do you need heat search? Do you need certifications? All these kinds of questions. What program? Is it military or not? ITAR rated. Well, if you don't pin these details down, what ends up happening is they just get lost along the way. You know, hey, did y'all say the uh, heat certificates on this um, on this material we bought? Oh, no, we didn't. And now you're scrambling for a piece of paper that says it came from this steel mill on this run on this day. All because why? We didn't button up these loose ends and clearly communicate that and understand what our customer needed and wanted and then communicate that internally into our team. Then finally, we have siloed communications. And, and this happens a lot, you know, where the engineering team says one thing, the estimating team says another thing, the sales team says a third thing, and operations has no clue what's happening, and finance doesn't approve of anything. We are <laughs> off in our own little department, and we're doing our own little thing, and we're happy, but we're, we, what we don't realize and what we don't see is how we're affecting everybody else. So when I look at this list, I, I would my first reaction is, it's a long list. At the same time, yeah. we know it's not the longer list or the longest list we could keep at this all day. Uh, and yet, on the other side, any one of these could be a killer. You, you want to do the quote, you want to win the quote, and any one of these things could kill the quote. It, it, Brad, the, the communications is really, um, it, it's, a, it's kind of a gauntlet that you have to run through just to get a quote out successfully and position it for you know the most success that it can have. Um, you know, when I was in accounting, I always will remember the partner would say, he would be like, Bo, you've got this technically correct, but how you've got it packaged will never fly with the powers that be. You've got to repackage this thing so that they can understand it and that they'll actually get, you know, get the point you're trying to communicate and approve what you have because you're right, but it's just not communicated well. And, um, you know, that's kind of stuck with me throughout my career. Yes, we want to be technically correct and all these things. We also have to package it and communicate what we're doing properly to our customers for clarity, understanding, and success, ultimately. So, Brad, let's take a look and let's just kind of talk through what we see as a, 
the usual situation at our clients as a starting point. So the usual situation is that, well, a, an RFQ comes in and estimating and engineering, they go to work, they squirrel it away and they start you know, developing plans, drawings and quotes and all this stuff, doing time studies. Well, that never gets communicated to the sales and what sales knows about this opportunity really never gets communicated back into estimating or engineering for that matter. And we also have to throw into the mix operations. You know, when sales is talking to the customer, are they actually talking to operations and making commitments that the organization can keep? Who knows? When the engineering is doing their work, do they actually know the capabilities of the machines that are out there on the floor? Are they designing you know, work that can be produced on these machines? Are they designing the work to be done in an effective and productive manner on the shop floor? or as is typical, are they just designing what makes the most sense to them, regardless of how operations is actually going to do it? Well, this is kind of the normal starting case, right? We don't talk sales and operations. Oh man, we know that we love the fight in those two departments. And you know, this is kind of the classic scenario. So this is what's happening internally. Well, what happens when we go to communicate with the, the poor customer in this deal? Well, Sales is saying one thing to the buyer and our engineering team who's working with our customers' project managers. Well, they're saying something completely different. Different deadlines, different requirements. I mean, it's like, are we even working on the same project here, guys? And, and this is kind of the standard fare. Now, what we haven't done is talk about these guys, the management. So you've got all the normal day-to-day, -day, just chaos and confusion, the you know, golly, what, what all emails are flying back into, nothing's right, nothing's on the same page. And then management goes, this is insane. We need to get involved. Well, at that point, you can just throw a bomb on the whole thing. Boom. I mean, this this is just a total disaster. And, and Brad, what we find is that customers are left exasperated and frustrated in dealing with you know, uh, their suppliers because they can't get what they want. They can't get clarity and they can't get a price and they don't understand what's happening. And our clients as a starting condition, they're the same way. They're frustrated. They don't have clarity. They're like, why is this so hard? I mean, we're making a part. It should be, you get the plan, you get the specs, you make the part, you ship it out, you invoice it. This isn't rocket science, but man, we make it hard here. So this is the normal starting case. So I'm going to go to the next slide and show folks how we see pricing communications and how we've coached our clients to communicate with their customers. That's great. So what we want is everybody on the same page. Now notice the arrows are all the same color. We're all working together. We want sales and operations, believe it or not, to actually get along with one another and communicate effectively between one another. It's got to be a two-way street. If operations can't do it, sales shouldn't sell it. And at the same time, operations needs feedback from sales because, hey, you've got to have this capability. We need this in order to be able to sell into the market, whether that's reliability, rapid delivery, uh, certain technical capabilities, you know, any number of things like that. It's a two-way street between sales and operations. We're on the same team. We've got to work together. Same thing with the rest of the organization. The management team should be overseeing an effective communications process, you know, from the start of the RFQ all the way through, ultimately through to invoicing, when you complete, ship, and invoice the job. So this is what we want to see, a harmonious uh, organization, all on the same page, all in alignment. Alignment is one of these big corporate buzzwords. Everybody, oh, we want to create strategic alignment across our teams. And it's like, well, what does that actually mean? To us, what that means is we are all looking at the same thing the same way we're on the same page. And if we had that level of clarity, guess what? We're all going to be able to communicate effectively with our customer. And the way we do that and create alignment is some, with something we call the number. And the number is the new measure of profitability in what we call the throughput world. And what it does is it allows everybody to look at an opportunity in working with a customer through this lens. And that's what that's supposed to be. There's a really big lens, but it focuses all of our efforts on looking at this opportunity in the same way across all of our departments. 
And if you think about it, that's one of the major contention points in communications. Operations talks about, uh, you know, oh gosh, we can't do this. Our gross margin will be too low. Sell says, who cares what gross margin is going to be? I get paid a commission off the revenue. Let's sell this thing. Same thing with engineering and estimating. And if you're the manager, basically you've got four or five, if we include finance in this, different groups in your company giving you four or five different answers about what should we charge? Is this a good job or not? Is this a fit? And what should the price be? Right? So with the number, we get clarity, we get alignment, and it gives everybody the same measure across the entire organization. And that's what creates the alignment, having the same measure for everybody. And out of that comes the communication strategy because we're not communicating what sales wants and what engineering needs and what estimating like to see and what the management team wants today or this hour or whatever. We're communicating what we as an organization need and that is the number. We need to earn the number. And so having that focusing lens gives us the ability to, com to communicate our requirements, not as individuals, but as a team and as a company out to our customer, to the buyers and to the project managers. So Brad, this has been, I think, one of the most powerful aspects of working, you know, our clients would tell you working with us is that they get confidence and clarity about how to communicate and they're much more effective as an organization in communicating pricing out to their customers. And as a result, they're much more effective in winning work, winning good work and winning profitable work. It seems something like a panacea to have all that alignment all, all of a sudden occur, but that's mm -hmm. in fact what we find. And you're correct, even though the, the term, the number might not make sense to anybody right now that in fact is the the key lever to to see the, the everything in the same way that uh, will probably be the subject of a future video if i had to guess brad <laughs> one or more yeah yeah so anyway this is how guys we approach pricing communications we utilize what we call the number it's the new measure profitability uh, in the throughput world it is the measure of profitability that we use in the velocity pricing system. And Brad, it's what you found in your business so many years ago, and it led you in guiding your organization to be much more profitable. And it's what's built into the velocity pricing system where we help clients you know, uh, substantially increase their net profit. So guys, that's all we got on pricing mistake number three, pricing communications. But uh, if you wanna learn more, head on over to www.velocitypricingsystem.com. Thanks, and we'll see you in the next one.